Hello, and welcome to the Vantage Seminar. We're continuing our series of talks on Shimura varieties uh, with a talk by Sagu Shin, who's speaking about the Langlands Rapoport conjecture and related topics. So is it all right for us to record this talk today? Yeah, wonderful. OK, and feel free to ask questions um, during, during the talk. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for the introduction and, and well, thanks for the invitation to speak. Uh, it's my great pleasure. Well, so today I'm going to speak on, well, following the, the general theme, uh, something about Shimura varieties and uh, yeah, it's more specifically Shimura varieties modular primes, the special fibers of Shimura varieties and points on them. And I'll try to explain why this may be interesting. So here we go. So here's the plan. So eventually I want to arrive at the Langlands Rappaport conjecture, which is one of the most beautiful conjectures on Schmore varieties. And it's about points of Schmore varieties modular primes. But to get there, I like to give some context. And well, there are many ways to arrive there, but I'll start from Hilbert's 12th problem and then uh, somehow explain how we go from there to Shimura varieties and then the land and the conjecture. So that's basically the goal of part one. And then in part two, I'll try to look more closely into this problem. So uh, again, the whole point is, point is to study mod p points of Shimura varieties, but then I'll introduce at least what the conjecture is saying and what is known or what is going to be known. Okay, so let's start. So the starting point is the Hilbert's 12th problem. Uh, and I recall that the problem is to roughly speaking, give a family of special functions and the, their values generating maximum mobility extensions. So given a number field, you want to generate all the obedient extensions or maximal obedient extensions by using some explicit function and its values. So that's a bit vague. So let's try to be a little more concrete. Well, over Q, that is, the Kronecker Weber theorem. And what that tells you is that essentially you can generate all maximal obedient extensions of Q by using values of exponential function. And more specifically, you can just use roots of unity, which can be thought of as special values of the exponential function. So that's the case of Q. And over an imaginary quadratic field, which is another well known case, this is basically Kronecker's dream from youth. And here you use uh, different kinds of functions, namely the modular J function and some elliptic functions. Um, I, I will not go into this much further, but this problem definitely motivated Shimura and Langland in their early investigation. So, well, <clears throat> The natural question is how do you do this over other field, other number fields, obviously, uh, like even over a real quadratic field or to a real field or over CM field or some arbitrary field. But yeah, it, there's some spectacular recent results which resolves this problem over to a real field by Das Gupta and Kakte uh, in a way a little bit different from the kind of the original way Hilbert may have envisioned, but in general, the problem is still open. But for me, uh, I like to quote Shimura on this problem. So what it, what it said in 1968 is that, well, basically in, uh, in the effort to generalize this to uh, other number fields, um, he was led to study automorphic functions and obedient varieties. 
Okay, so, so there is a good reason to study them. All right, are there any questions at, at this point? Uh, no, no questions I see in the okay. chat so far. Okay, then I'll move on, well, to the story of Shimura a little bit. So, yeah, I just captured <laughs> um, a young Shimura in all Shimura's pictures and, and the internet. Well, in any case, well, uh, yeah, the, what I just explained is Kronecker's Jugendtraum and Hilbert's 12th problem. And there are Eldrig aspects and the analytic aspects. And well, the analytic aspects, obviously, because we want to use some sort of analytic functions like the modular J function, elliptic functions, exponential functions, et cetera, <clears throat> to understand what's going on. And as I just showed you, Shimura was uh, motivated to study more general automorphic forms. Uh, and of course, there is an existing theory initiated by Heck and Ziegel and also other people. And in the Eldrig approach to this problem, as you can see in the case of imaginary quadratic fields, you are basically led to understand CM theory or complex multiplication theory for elliptic curves. Namely, if you're interested in the case of a particular imaginary quadratic field, then you want to consider elliptic curves which have extra endomorphisms given by this imaginary quadratic field. And more generally, elliptic curves are just um, special cases of abelian varieties. And it, it well, it kind of pleasant surprise that there is a complex multiplication theory for these higher dimensional generalizations of elliptic curves. And that was extensively studied by Shimura and Tanyama. Uh, so the, basically, we have the basic algebraic tools to understand this problem. And they were, in some sense, uh, put together in, in the theory of Shimura varieties. And although that's slightly uh, although it is rooted in, the, in Hilbert's 12th problem, now we are kind of opening new doors. But in the theory of Shimura varieties, these things come together. Uh, so Shimura varieties uh, are, well, I would say this in vague terms, Shimura varieties are geometric uh, versions of automorphic forms or geometric realizations of automorphic forms. But the function field of Shimura varieties is uh, automorphic function and I mean, they consist of automorphic functions. But on the other hand, Shimura varieties are closely related to um, abelian varieties with complex multiplication, as I'll maybe illustrate this more later, but it's, it's very important. It, when I say canonical models, Shimura varieties are not just some varieties defined over complex numbers or even some algebraically closed fields like Q bar, but Shimura varieties are naturally defined over a number field. And to do this, really, uh, you need a serious use of complex multiplication theory. So it has both analytic and algebraic aspects. And that is a kind of key point for understanding some other problems, as I'll get to. But before, uh, Going further, I like to make this a little more precise. And the best way to make it precise is to not to give a general definition of Shimura varieties, which is quite complicated, but to concentrate on some uh, fundamental examples. So, so I chose the example of modular curves, which you may have seen. So I'll just call it M1. And here I'm a little bit vague, but M1 is, you want to think of it as the moduli space of elliptic curves. Uh, it's not, I mean, the Shimura's definition is not given in terms of moduli problems, but to, to help you understand what they are good for. And also, I mean, this is the perspective you often take 
in arithmetic applications. So I'll just consider M1 as the uh, moduli space of elliptic curves with additional structures such as something about you know, torsion points or torsion subgroups of elliptic curves. Uh, but yeah, essentially it's the moduli space of elliptic curves with some additional structure, which turns out to be a quasi-projective curve over Q. And well, the more familiar complex picture is that the complex points really correspond to the upper half plane modulo the linear fractional tra transformation action by SL to Z. And that's analytically identified with A1, the affine line over C. And if you want to be more concrete, then this is how things correspond. For instance, if you pick a point in the upper half plane, then you consider the complex plane modulo the lattice generated by one and tau that's going to give you a complex torus that which represents an elliptic curve. And to go the other way, you just evaluate the modular J function at tau and you have this isomorphism. So that's what's happening in the case of modular curves. And if you really follow the formalism more of right is then you would actually construct the object as a, an algebraic variety over C first. And then you are going to prove that it is actually defined over Q. And, and the canonical model turns out to be uh, isomorphic to the moduli theoretic definition of modular curve. Okay, so that's one example. And the higher dimensional example is the Ziegel modular varieties, which are also very important. Uh, so it, it's, they are Ziegel and Mumford, and Mumford show that there is a moduli theoretic description of these varieties uh, over, over Q and even over Z. Um, so yeah, it's uh, now when G is one, you will recover the previous example of modular curves, but here I have a possibly bigger positive integer G, and then you want to consider the moduli space of polarized abelian varieties of dimension G, uh, or principally polarized if you like. It doesn't too matter too much for my talk, but. Yeah, you consider this moduli space and then with additional structures as before, then it's representable by a quasi-projective variety over Q and its dimension turns out to be G times G plus one over two. And you can quickly check that when G is one is, the dimension is equal to one and that's the case of modular curves. And I won't say too much more about this, but again, yeah, the Ziegel case is also a special case of Schumer varieties and there is a, if you follow the Lin's formalism of Shimura varieties, then there is a choice of Shimura datum, so-called Shimura datum, which gives rise to these Ziegel modular varieties. So these are two fundamental examples of Shimura varieties you may want to keep in mind. Okay. Okay. And I, as I alluded to earlier, um, this the moduli description coincide with the canonical model uh, by Shimura's definition over Q. So far, I'm not talking about integral models yet, so I stay over number fields, but yeah, the, over Q, they, they are actually isomorphic and it's not a tautology, it's something we need to check. Okay. All right, so uh, yeah, what, do I want to think about Shimura varieties? Well, there are many problems people ask about Shimura varieties. Uh, there are all sorts of interesting geometric questions, for instance, but here I'll concentrate on a particular aspect uh, following Shimura in his ICM address in 1966 that goes back more than 50 years. And I you know, rephrase a little bit, but it's, I maintain the same spirit. Uh, so the 
he proposed to construct canonical models of a small variety of silver number fields um, in general. Uh, oh, maybe I should say what that means. Well, because I maybe I almost suggested that these canonical models were already constructed, but in fact, what Shimura did is he constructed canonical models essentially in the case of PEL type Shimura varieties and there are more general Shimura varieties. So uh, the problem is to construct canonical models for all Shimura varieties, not, not just for some Shimura varieties. So that's the question. And another question is, well, find the connection between the Hasse Bay zeta function of Shimura varieties and on the one hand and Hecke eigenvalues for automorphic forms on the other hand. Well, for the zeta function, I'm talking about the Hasse Bay zeta function, which is defined to be the infinite product over, uh, over all primes or almost all primes. And each local factor at P will essentially encode the number of points of Shimura varieties modulo P over uh, various finite fields, Fp, Fp squared, Fp cubed, et cetera. Uh, and on the other side, I mean, in, in the context of modular forms, we would just say heck eigenvalues, but in general for automorphic forms or automorphic representations, if you're taking a representation theory viewpoint, then you may also hear socket parameters and yeah, the, these are, almost synonymous. So you can just take any definition you may be familiar with, but yeah, these are the uh, all about automorphic forms. And here it's all about the you know, number of points of Shimura varieties modulo primes. So you want to find the connection. Well, so find the connection sounds weak, but in fact, Shimura proved something very precise. Oops, uh, it's hard to turn the page. Okay, so what Shimura showed is that at least in the one-dimensional cases, most notably for modular curves and Shimura curves, in the case of modular curves, it's due to Shimura and Eichler. Uh, which is, yeah, basically he, what he showed is essentially that the zeta function of one-dimensional Shimura varieties is equal to the product of L functions of modular forms or, or, or automorphic forms and some quaternion algebras. So that's what he showed. So there, there's a very precise equality one can show and then now you can imagine how do we generalize. So maybe on the left-hand side, you still have the zeta function of your Shimura variety. And then on the right-hand side, it could be some product of automorphic L functions. Right, so that's the problem. So let me first address the first problem, the construction of canonical models over number fields. So Lean generalized this Shimura's results to the so-called obedient type Shimura varieties, first to Hodge type and then to obedient type in two important papers. So, so that was an important result and then to deal with all Shimura varieties that was uh, due to Borovoy and Mill, it was done in early 80s. And then, well, as for the second problem to find the connection between these two things, well, Langland proposed a program and that is going to be the topic I'm going to focus on from now. So how do we relate these two things, right? So let's see what we can say. Are there questions at this point? Okay. Okay, so that brings us to another Hilbert problem, namely Hilbert's ninth problem. And that is to find the most general reciprocity law over every number field. It's closely related to the 12th problem, but then in the 12th problem, you restrict yourself to abelian extensions, and then you want to somehow understand all the abelian extensions of number fields explicitly. 
through values of some special functions. Here, you imagine the class field theory first. Class field theory tells you a lot about some reciprocity law, but you want to find kind of ultimate reciprocity law that goes much beyond class field theory, because class field theory doesn't see beyond uh, obedient extensions of number fields. Okay, so whatever that means, that was the that was the problem, and of course, I wouldn't say there's a single answer to this because one can imagine different kinds of generalizations or general reciprocity laws. But whatever it, it is, it should generalize the quadratic reciprocity and also Artin reciprocity, namely class field theory. And one such general reciprocity law was proposed by Lennon. And <clears throat> also I'm now quoting Tate. There was a proceeding on in 19, 1974 on all the Hilbert problems and Tate somehow took on Hilbert's ninth problem and then that's what he wrote. And you don't have to read it all, but yeah, basically saying, well, this was suggesting that uh, there is a interesting general conjectures by Lamens. Okay, so so that's one convincing generalization in this direction. So let me tell you a bit more about this. And interestingly, <clears throat> in the same proceedings, Langdon wrote about the wrote about twelfth problem, not the ninth problem. And Tate was talking about the ninth problem, and then basically suggesting, well, the Langdon's program is maybe one such generalization. Anyway, um, the twelfth problem is as I introduced at the very beginning, it's about uh, Kronecker, Jugendtraum and its generalization. And you can maybe sense that, well, Langlands, although what Langlands tries to achieve is not quite Hilbert's problem itself, but he's rooted in this tradition. <clears throat> But as I said, what Langland was really interested in is to show this connection or it's closely related to Shimura's problems. Uh, namely, well, on the one hand, you have the zeta function or L function of Shimura varieties. And then on the other hand, you have the automorphic L functions. And one new observation which is not the only new observation, is that he observed something more precise, namely these automorphic forms on what groups should they live? And if, you're, if you have seen the context of Schumann varieties, then there's always some connected reductive group that is part of the Schumann datum giving rise to your favorite Schumann varieties. So there's always some reductive group G over Q in this context, but then he realized that, well, so most general, most, well, I would say most natural uh, or naive guess would be that these automorphic forms should all live on this particular group, uh, the group already given to you by Shimura varieties, and then just look at those L automorphic L functions. But it turns out that <clears throat> that is not quite the case, even in some low rank examples. So realize that it's, it, these automorphic forms live on not only the group already given to you, but also some other groups, certain related groups. <clears throat> and if you are somewhat familiar with automorphic forms, then you may know what they are. So, <clears throat> these are called endoscopic groups and nowadays extem ex extensively studied in the theory of automorphic forms. And by studying this world, well, yeah, what's, what's good about understanding this picture? Well, one useful and maybe in my opinion, extremely important application is that, yeah, this understanding this picture has led to many instances of Langlands reciprocity. And in fact, I would say 
essentially all known examples come from this kind of consideration. Even in the case of modular forms, essentially what, what you do is, uh, well, the L functions of modular, modular curves, modular curves are smaller varieties. The L functions of modular curves is the product of, well, basically L functions of modular forms. And well, understanding this picture is almost equivalent to uh, understanding this Langlands reciprocity for GL2 over Q. So, I mean, at least in the case of holomorphic modular forms. All right, so uh, I hope I said enough about the motivation. So in, to summarize, this is the, uh, the kind of equality we are after. So the zeta function of Schumer variety, and I'm kind of mi mixing zeta function and L function for Schumer varieties, but yeah, I would say, let's say just zeta function, uh, has a base zeta function uh, there on the left-hand side. Then, as I suggested, uh, I mean, Langlands observed that it should be the product of some automorphic L functions. And a little more precisely, in the automorphic L function, you, it's, of course, a function in the complex variable S, but there's some additional data. So there's some related group, or as I refer to as an endoscopic group, there's an endoscopic group H and there's an automorphic representation on that group, which is pi. And then also you need to actually choose a representation of the Langlands L group of H. So R is there. If you're not familiar, you can ignore it for now, but R is going to be given from the context. And then A is also there for a technical reason. Because first of all, it's, uh, also an aging product. So a priori it may be plus one or minus one, but because of automorphic multiplicity phenomenon, A could be something else. The absolute value of A could be bigger than one sometimes, but that's just the technical point. And well, how, so how do we want to prove this? Langlands and Codwitz and Rappaport and other people yeah, developed the whole program to approach this problem. So that's what I like to explain next. What did they propose? So uh, to, again, quote Langlands, he mentioned three important matters to approach this problem. So the first is you want to obviously understand mod p points of your small variety because if you still remember the zeta function is the product of local factors at P and each local factor at P counts the number of points in characteristic P. So it's obviously something you want to understand. And by structure, I mean more than the number of points because to relate to the right-hand side, right-hand side is about some oral reforms and this, a lot of information is encoded by the local factors of the automorphic representations or heck eigenvalues, if you like. Uh, and it's given by some big adelic group action of H or G. A priori, it's uh, adelic group action of G, the, the group G going into the definition of Schumer varieties. So you want to understand this mod P point together with this so-called hack action. So it's some additional symmetries that are always present in the picture of Shimura varieties. So understanding this is really the point of the London Rappel conjecture. You want to take the set of mod B points and then of course, being in characteristic P, there's always forbidden action. And then you have this additional hack action and you want to describe this set of points with this forbidden and hack action. So that's the point of Langland Rappel conjecture, which I'll get to. But this second matter is that, well, after all, which pi and r, r and a occur, and of course, which h occur as well. Uh, so maybe I'll write h is also part of the picture. And 
Well, understanding this ma matter is the uh, theory of endoscopy in, in the theory of holomorphic forms. In the early days also referred to as L indistinguishability. That's quite mouthful. Uh, and the third matter is to analyze, well, once you have this, once you un understand the structure of multiple points, then you want to use it to prove the equality. And the basic idea is to analyze the outcome in relation to the author cellbook trace formula, which is all about automorphic forms and which essentially contains all the information about uh, this invariance going into the definition of L functions. So this part was originally thought of as combinatorial. Uh, it, it turned out to require much more than just combinatorial ideas, but in any case, that if this part is about counting points. Once you understand the structure of mod P points, counting fixed points and then stabilization in the sense of the trace formula and then also the fundamental lemma that is now famous, uh, famous result of Ungo and other people. Right, so these are some important matters and how do, can we put them together? Well. That is what I refer to as the London's cut with Rappelford method because it's obviously attributed to these people. Um, you first start from the London's Rappelford conjecture and then you apply the fixed point formula. If, for instance, to understand the zeta function, what you're going to do is to understand the number of points of over finite field. And then, no, well, point over finite field is just fixed points of some power of Frobenius. So as you can see, there's some fixed point formula involved to understand this. And then you arrive at some coarse formula for more varieties, but, and then you want to turn this formula into something more precise, which will ultimately tell you about the right-hand side. And to do this, you need to understand this endoscopic matters and also all the other matters to arrive at the expression really giving you that what you have is really the uh, this kind of automorphic L functions. And it's essentially you either, whether you are in the context of zeta functions or a little more generally in the context of analytic cohomology of Schumer varieties, whichever you're computing, the outcome will be that these can be described in terms of automorphic forms. So that's the overview of the method. So now let me tell you more details how this method works. Okay, other questions? That looks great. Okay, so far so good. Let me then continue. All right, so it's, it's time to make the langland rappel conjecture more precise. So. If, the initial formulation was done in 1987, and then there were some small corrections and refinements later, but, but it's, a, it's a kind of really important conjecture. The first part is about the existence of integral canonical models, well, or some, at least some natural integral model you want to work with. So as I said, when I say canonical models, they are defined over some natural number fields, but then you want to spread them over some ring of integers. For instance, you're already, your canonical model is defined over Q, then you want to find an integral model over ZP for almost all primes P, or if you're lucky, then maybe for all primes P, not just almost all, uh, in that case, you may need to understand bad reduction. But here, implicitly in my talk, I'll just consider the case of good reduction. In technical terms, I'm putting the hyperspecial subgroup as a level subgroup at P. And the second part of the conjecture is that, I mean, this is the set we want to understand. Uh, 
uh, for each prime p, you want to understand fp bar point of your Shimura variety. Uh, and as I said before, there are not some interesting group actions, namely the Frobenius action, because it's defined in characteristic p. And then, well, this is, of course, makes sense because you have part one. First, you have this integral model of a ring of integers. So you, it makes sense to take modulo p. And then now you have this Frobenius action. Uh, and then uh, there's also heck action, which is present in, in the context of Shimura variety, which is quite special about Shimura variety. So of course, you don't have anything like this for general algebraic varieties. So you want to understand this uh, Frobenius hack action. And the conjecture says that it can be understood in terms of some other data, some sort of group theoretic data. So let me explain what the right-hand side is really saying. So the, you can do this over more general Shimura varieties, but then I need to introduce uh, many unpleasant notions. <clears throat> so uh, rather I'll just concentrate on the Ziegel case. Uh, that's already a non-trivial case. And let's say, in the, remember that in the Ziegel case, Ziegel modular variety is a moduli space of polarized abelian varieties of dimension G. So in this case, what does it mean? Well, first there is a partition and this partition should correspond to the partition of my Shimura variety. Again, because of the moduli theoretic interpretation, this left-hand side basically corresponds to polarized the median varieties over FP bar. And for those of median varieties, I can consider isogeny classes. So this partition should correspond to the partition of the left-hand side into isogeny classes. So, so that makes sense. And it's a, some kind of parameter for a different isogeny classes. And then now the question is, in each isogeny class, how do you want to parametrize polarized abelian varieties in a given isogeny class? So maybe you fix some sort of base abelian variety A. So I fix an isogeny class now, and then, and then now you want to consider all the other abelian varieties in the given isogeny class. So there are essentially two ways to arrive at other polarized abelian varieties, namely you can use P power isogeny class, P power isogeny, or you can use prime to P isogeny. And then, well, if you use both of them, P power and prime to P isogenies, then you can exhaust every abelian variety in your isogeny class. And then the only thing you need to do is to take the quotient by any redundancy. So that's basically what's going on here, this P power isogeny and prime to P power isogeny, and then you mod out by the redundancy. So, so as I just said, X upper P is prime to P isogeny, and then I phi uh, is about uh, automorphism group in the isogeny category or self core self isogenies essentially. And that's basically the, yeah, you, you want to take, take uh, account for redundancy in the counting. So the whole point for having this conjecture or proving this conjecture is that, well, once you know this conjecture, there's a Frobenius action here and the prime to p hack action is here. And well, on the left-hand side, they're somehow mingled together, but on the right-hand side, they're kind of clearly divided. And also these sets are kind of more explicit. They're group theoretically easier to understand. 
And an important point is that once you transition through the bijection to the right-hand side, then it's a purely group theoretic expression and there's no abelian varieties anymore. Although initially you're, you have just the, some equivalence classes of polarized abelian varieties over a P bar. And that's important because eventually you, what you want to prove is that uh, starting from some similar varieties, you want to arrive at a purely automorphic expression. And of course, auto, if we want to prove such a thing, then automorphic forms do not see any obedient varieties. So it's important that obedient varieties are now removed from the picture and replaced with some more group theoretic expression. Then you have a better chance of proving the equality you wanted to prove. Okay. So I recall that the statement says there's this bijection, Hecken, Frobin's equivalent bijection. Still, it's a little too abstract. So uh, I'll give you some example. Previously, I showed you a one dimensional example of modular curves, but let me even consider the zero dimensional small variety, where if you are familiar with the Shimura datum, then here the group involved is the restriction of scalar of f over q of gm. That's my re reductive group implicit in the picture. But in any case, here it's a coarse moduli space of elliptic curves with complex multiplication by f, or you can also attach additional structure if you like. Um, then what happens? Well, at P bar point in this case, turns out to be in bijection with this kind of quotient. And I colored it carefully so that it matches up with uh, the right-hand side of the London Rappaport conjecture. And you notice that there's no partition. This corresponds to the fact that, well, once you fix the field F, uh, the major quadratic field, then all, all the elliptic curves with CM by F are isogenous. So there's a single isogeny class, it turns out. Um, and then, well, we, this expression, although it looks somewhat complicated, if you put them together, then it's just an adelic description of, well, something close to, well, class groups or generalized class groups. And here, it really uh, resembles the CM theory. I mean, the, the whole point of proving the Langner's rapport conjecture in this particular case is just combination of class field theory and CM theory. And well, what is the point? The point really lies in a matching Frobenius. So you have Frobenius, and then this set also has uh, group theoretically defined Frobenius. And in this case, it's just, uh, the, well, the uniformizer acting by multiplication. And well, proving that Frobenius action, Frobenius action corresponds to the uniformizer represented by prime ideal at P. Well, proving this kind of relation is really at the heart of CM theory. Right, so it really captures the, the main part of CM theory in this particular case. Okay. Uh, so I hope that makes this statement a little more concrete. Okay, so the next simplest is maybe dimension one. And already in that case, it's, little uh, complicated to explain all the details, but let me say just one thing. Let me underline one important aspect, which is that uh, now, what is this? It's uh, essentially it is some isomorphism classes of elliptic curves over FP bar with additional structures. And 
In this case, well, the idea to prove it, uh, one important idea to prove the Langner Rapport conjecture in this case is to consider many zero dimensional subsumer varieties. And these subsumer varieties are given by the preceding example, namely, well, among elliptic curves, all elliptic curves, they, they are elliptic curves with CM by the given the imaginary quadrant field F. And now there's a choice of F. So if you vary your imaginary quadrant fields, then there are lots and lots of zero dimensional subsumer varieties of this type. And it turns out that, well, the, if you, as you vary the field F, the image of this map is big enough. It covers lots and lots and lots of points of S. So that, that basically gives you a way to understand the picture because, well, you rather understand what is going on in SF pretty well by using ZM theory and other things. And, and you use it as, an, as a way to understand what's happening on points of your modular curve or some higher dimensional summer variety. And here, what I'm trying to say is captured by the following key principle. <clears throat> it's part of Honda Tate theory, but basically what it more precisely, when I say you can probe the given summer variety using this zero dimensional subsumer variety. What I'm saying in terms of abelian varieties is that well, in my underlying Schumer variety, there are many isogenic classes, and these isogenic classes contain mod p reduction of CM points. So in this case, if I fix an isogenic class, then I can find the major quadratic field F such that this isogenic class contains the image of this map. So in that sense, every isogenic class uh, can be understood. Uh, at least we, you can find the point in every isogenous class that comes from some zero dimensional summer variety. So that's uh, one of the uh, key principles to understand this picture. Then it means that you have at least one point in each isogenous class, and then you can try, starting from there, you can try to understand all the other points in the given isogenous class. Okay, so it's time to tell you what is known. So I try to explain the statement of the conjecture. So yeah, what do we know? For obedient type Schumer varieties, now this is a general, quite, gen, quite a general class of Schumer varieties, but it leaves out some exceptional Schumer varieties. So in this case, well, as for the first problem of constructing integral canonical models, it was done by Kissin and Madapu Sipera Kim. And as for the second problem, Kissin proved a, a weaker version of the conjecture modulo some ambiguity in this quotient. So if you look at this quotient, then you're quotienting out by some left action of this group. Uh, but, and it's a little technical to explain, but modular ambiguity means that maybe there's some natural action of I phi Q on this product, but it may not be the nat natural action, but it could be in bijection with the quotient with respect to some other action. So that sounds a little weird, but that's what comes out of his proof. So let me just leave there. Oh, leave it there, just to module some ambiguity in this quotient. So uh, the real problem is that, well, the, if you remember the, the basic overview of how the Langland to with rapport method works, then that's the path you want to take. But of course, the Langland rapport conjecture is not known and still unknown in most cases. And Kissin's result was, well, really extraordinary, it was really nice, but somehow we didn't see how to go from there to arrive at the trace formula we want so that we 
really understand this problem. I mean, the goal, remember that the goal is to understand the zeta function or the analytic homology of Shimon varieties in terms of automorphic forms. So, and it seems like there was some essential difficulty for doing this. If you just take the outcome of his theorem. So that was the status of the problem. So what to do about it? So in uh, recent work with Mark Kissin and Yi Hang Zhu, who are in the pictures. So we prove a stronger version of the theorem, namely still for abelian types and more varieties, and I'm assuming good reduction or hyperspecial level at P. Um, and the, here's this uh, Langlet Rappel conjecture, but we, we remove the ambiguity to a good extent uh, in the previous work. And, but the, uh, really the point is that by removing the ambiguity to a good extent, we pave the way for these intended applications. Namely, we remove the uh, obstacle for this and let me make it a little more precise. First of all, it's, this means that, well, as long as you assume all the uh, classification results for automorphic representations, then you will actually get a result uh, about either zeta function or the et al cohomology. That's one point. But yeah, there's something technical about this compact support cohomology. So there's actually some serious issue, but I mean, which is orthogonal to the either the Langlands Rappaport or uh, this endoscopic classification. But yeah, I'll maybe say a word about that later. But the basic picture is the following now that we have this theorem. So it's, so we have an improved version of the Langer Rappaport. And then from, the, from there, we arrive at the trace formula for Shimura varieties as we wanted to have. And, and that's the key intermediate step to arrive at uh, the desired expression for zeta functions or analytic cohomology in terms of homomorphic forms. So that's how this theorem fits into the overall picture. And now let me, explain a bit more about this because, well, it's, it's, I said modular less ambiguity, but it still sounds pretty ambiguous. I mean, the statement itself sounds pretty ambiguous. So the first point is that, well, you need to somehow probe things better, probe the point of my point of mod P, or I mean, probe mod P points of Shimura varieties better by using some more tools. And this includes Steele's DM theory that's at the heart of the method always, but also some integral periodic Hodge theory and other things. That's one thing to say, but to, but to tell you more, uh, I need to recall how it works at the outset. So this is the part coming from CM theory, I would say. Special points are roughly synonymous to the points corresponding to CM of EM varieties. So it's kind of CM theory, and that gives us uh, some key inputs. Namely, using CM theory, we, I, I have a bridge between the two worlds that I like to connect in the London Rapport conjecture. On the one hand, I have I saw it in classes in my Shimura variety. And on the other side, I have some group theoretically defined data, which I didn't quite explain. I only explained what they should correspond to on the geometric side. But the good thing, good news is that wherever they are, this input from CM theory will surject onto both sides. Uh, so I can really try to connect, or you, you, one way to say it is, this kind of gives you a correspondence between the two sets in some sense. And then, and then you know that this, you want to know that whether this correspondence really 
well defined or does it really transport information from one side to the other? And one way to do it is that somehow the, if you start from here, then there's a community of diagrams. So there's some kind of invariant you can read off from both sides. And then you can say that if you started from the same data, then you arrive at the same data. So, so you have some control of uh, how things work, work in this picture. And basically what this improved is that, well, there's some, when you do this, somehow there's lots of information. Uh, I mean, these Codwiz triples do not remember all the information you want to remember. So going through this diagram, somehow there's some error occurring when you construct the correspondence in this way. So I would say it's, there's an adelic error in the sense of Galois cohomology. So there's some Galois co adelic Galois cohomology class that measures this error. And then it was really difficult to pin down. And then essentially what happens in, in the new work is that you, you have less ambiguity and what that means technically is that now the error is rational in the sense that this Galois cohomology class, which is a priori adelic and somehow hard to control is actually rational. Uh, so, and somehow this rational error doesn't affect the, counting of fixed points in the fixed point formula. So that's why things work fine. And this is again, very rough, but to get there, we need to match things a bit more precisely. And basically what happens is, well, I don't have enough time to explain, but we have some, some box in between. So, uh, there's some, something more we find, uh, we, can, we can construct in terms of the diagram and, and then things commute in this new diagram and somehow we, you try to remember more information. And when you try to do this, you need to use some, some tools like integral periodic hard theory and other things. So, but it's really quite technical. So let me not get in there uh, more, but let me just move on to briefly comment on some further directions. So there are some obvious things you can try to do beyond this work, namely to deal with bad reduction. So the, the preceding theorem was all about good reduction at P, but there's bad reduction and then you can think about integral model. Integral models were constructed by Kissin Papas and there's also work by Papas and Rappaport. But yeah, the integral model and also you want to con con uh, prove something like London Rappaport in that setup as well. And then there are all kinds of um, other problems that were, and there are different approaches uh, due to Harris Taylor Mantovan and also hence caught with Rappaport and also Schultz that there are at least three different approaches to this problem. Um, and also, I, as I alluded to earlier, the method of KS, KSZ deals with a priori compact support cohomology because, well, the fixed point formula a priori applies to compact support cohomology, but then you can also consider intersection cohomology, which is actually a natural goal in this context. And then there's, so Igusa varieties, um, they are closely related to Shimura varieties. And then there is something like London Rappaport problem can be stated. Um, so there, and there are many people who contributed to understanding this, but there's still, uh, uh, we are not there yet. So uh, if you're young and interested in this problem, then certainly there should be a prob problem you can work on. Uh, and of course, uh, not, I'm not exhaustive, so I apologize for any omission. And that's pretty much it. So uh, thank you so much. <laughs>